Welcome to the Precious Testimonies broadcast. I'm Norm Rasmussen, your host. In the Old Testament book of Psalm, chapter 96, verse 3, it reads, Declare God's glory among the nations. Well, Precious Testimonies has been called of God to do just that. And we're to do that by giving born-again Christians an opportunity to share what Jesus has done in their lives to the glory of God the Father and, of course, the Holy Spirit and, of course, Jesus himself. And so with that, we're going to let you hear some people sharing how uh, God has worked in their lives and what this Jesus has done for them and what he means to them. And I pray that this will be something God uses to either help you come to uh, a precious relationship with God or grow in your relationship with God. And with that now, let's listen to what uh, some folks have to say about this great and mighty Savior whose name is Jesus Christ. My name is Jennifer Fulweiler. I was a lifelong atheist and I'm now a Christian. I write a blog called Conversion Diary it's a chronicle of the ups and downs of what it's like to have faith after an entire life of being an atheist. I never believed in God, not even as a child. When my dad would come read books to me at night, I believe I was in fourth or fifth grade, and our nightly reading was Carl Sagan's Cosmos. <laughs> so I was very much raised on a diet of science and reason and evidence-based rational thought. You believe what you can prove. I believe that I have hands because I can see them. I believe in a black hole even though I've never seen one, but you know, science can tell us about the way matter moves around it that we can observe. And so this very rational worldview always made sense to me on a fundamental level. Before I got to the point that I could really start researching faith with an open mind, something had to happen. And for me, that occurred after my first child was born. I looked down and thought, what is this baby? And I thought, well, from a pure atheist materialist perspective, he is a collection of randomly evolved chemical reactions. And I realized if that's true, that all the love that I feel for him, that it's all nothing more than chemical reactions in our brains. And I looked down at him and I realized that's not true. It's not the truth. And I didn't know where to go from there, but that's what prompted me to start researching topics of spirituality. I got my books about Buddhism and you know, and about every religion except for Christianity, basically. I assumed that anything could be true except for Christianity. And my husband, who considered himself a non-practicing Christian, said, you might want to start with the one major world religion whose founder claimed to be God. After all, that's a really easy claim to disprove if it's not true. And I thought, well, that's a fair point. I was such a through and through atheist that I have to admit I was ignorant of all these great Christian thinkers. What about Thomas Aquinas? <laughs> what about Augustine? What about Descartes? I mean, all of these great thinkers throughout history were not only theists, but Christians. And I was really surprised when I actually found these very intellectually rigorous books where people talked about their faith from a place of reason and not a place of emotion. And when I looked at evidence like that on the whole, I started to think something explosive, something world-changing happened in first century Palestine. You have this guy named Jesus who comes from a lower class region, gains a bunch of lower class followers, and ends up being executed by the Romans and yet in droves, you see thousands and thousands of Jews giving up these traditions that they had held dear for thousands of years. And the people who joined in on this new religion, there was no benefit for them. It was a persecuted religion. People who joined this religion didn't tend to work out too well. They tended to lose social status and often face death. But I wasn't yet you know, convinced and, and ready to become a Christian. And so I started a blog. I just threw out every hard question 
I could think of. I just put it all out there on the blog. And as I would watch the atheists and the Christians go back and forth and debate, I realized we atheists, we don't have the lock on reason that I thought we did. But what I saw with the Christians was they had that too. They had all the knowledge of science and material world that, that we atheists did. But yet they had the total picture of the human experience of love and triumph and hope. And, you know, they could articulate that in a way that the atheists couldn't. It wasn't until after I had made the intellectual decision to become a Christian that I think I finally believed it in my heart. When I set my pride aside and said, okay, I feel like I'm talking to myself, but Jesus, I want a relationship with you. I, I want to know you, even though I don't know how to go about doing that. This peace entered my life, this joy, the way my whole being was transformed there was just no question that this is somebody real. I think that not only am I more alive uh, now that I'm a Christian, but I'm so much more intellectually alive. Finally, nothing is off limits. I can ask questions about science, but I can also ask questions about the spiritual world, and I'm free to really seek the truth. My name is Alex, and today I'm gonna to share with you my testimony on uh, how I came to God and Christ 12 years ago, this is back in 1999 and I was not a church goer, I, was, I didn't even go to church and, and I, even though I go now, here and there, I have gone and well, let me tell you my testimony and you just take it as you will, you know and um, to me it's not about that, it's about one thing, it's about seeking God to the point where you want is God revealed to you in all your heart? But not just that, is one step before that. That's one part of it, but let's just start with the testimony. Uh, so 11 years ago, after a spree of just, you know, going to clubs with friends, drinking, smoking, just like living it up, you know, I was like 21, 22, 23, and right around the end of the 23rd year of my life, I kind of, 24th year, I kind of had been fed up with it, you know, I had a few experiences that kind of like had me question myself, like, you know, is this really what I want? You know, I could see darkness coming into my life. I could feel like, I could feel me changing actually into this kind of like pleasure bunny, you know, basically a pleasure seeker and without this like debauchery, I couldn't have fun. and. And uh, I came to a point where I decided, you know what, I've already, I've already done enough damage in this body, you know, let me, let me put it aside for a while. So I stopped going out and I just spent more time at home. It was my mom and I alone and she was pretty sick at the time, you know, she was sick all her life. She had this rare disease where her arteries got thinner and uh, it was called Takayatsu disease that did eventually take her life but you know we'll get back to that later anyways so it was just me and my mom and I went to work I came home and so I stopped partying for like at least six months or so and I actually got more depressed because now I wasn't having that release anymore you know so you know I started smoking cigarettes again I kind of went back to the marijuana again and I kept it at that. I kept it at that. I didn't really go do any of the, the party drugs anymore, the rave drugs. I had enough with that, you know, a couple of uh, years before that. Just like, I felt too much uh, pain come from those, uh, from, from, from that type of living into my life. Like, I felt like stress all the time, anxiousness, anxiety. But putting it away for such a long time, for like six months, really kind of cleared my head. But from that aspect of it all but in a humanistic aspect I still had like ambition, wants, money I wanted money, I wanted to be like quote unquote wise, knowledgeable so I was reading a lot and it was almost as if my happiness was contingent on these factors and I came to the conclusion that that this is wrong, that why should I need certain things in order to be happy, why can't I just be happy you know, I understand you gotta eat good, 
exercise and all that, but I was doing all that, but I still wasn't fully content. It was almost like there was this little bit in me that was always like hungry, insatiably kind of like searching for answers and it was beyond like human happiness I was seeking at this point. So basically I started reading. I started reading the New Testament, not the Old. And I, I, someone told me in my life, I had a couple of Christian friends that I was moderately friends with. They kept stressing, well, it's the New Testament. That's the promise, they called it. And the Old Testament is the law and the commandments and stuff. So, you know, looking at it, the Old Testament was a thousand pages and the New Testament was 200 pages. So yeah, I think I'd read the New Testament, you know, uh, if God's going to come through, then let him come through with that. But the only thing I was asking for, I was asking God for this inner happiness. I was asking him for a new me, a new perception, I used to say. I need new eyes, I need new perception, an outlook. I, I told him, you know, yeah, granted, I partied, this and that, and, you know, but I felt like I had a need in me. That's why I did that, you know, like. Like, there's something wrong just from the beginning. Like, ever since I grew out of childhood, it was just this need to belong, this, like, I couldn't explain it. I just said, God, you know, I need a new self, you know, if that's possible. And, you know, I actually asked for a few weeks without reading. Nothing happened. So, I figured, okay, you know what, let me read. Before I discount God altogether, let me give it a chance. Let me read the New Testament. It's only 200 pages long. Let's give it a go, you know. So I started reading, I started cutting out the cigarettes, I put everything, I remember I got a Ziploc, I put everything, my cigarettes, my lighter, the weed, everything, I zipped it up, put it on my shelf, and I, you know, I even disconnected my TV, shut off my computer, and I decided I'm going to go to work, come home, go for walks, and read, and ask, that's it. And I figured I would do this because Jesus said, follow me, he said, and if you want to receive me, you got to follow me, and he went to a desert for 40 days. I couldn't do that, you know, I had my mom to take care of, I had, you know, I couldn't go to the desert for 40 days fasting, that was crazy to me, you know, so I figured I, at the least I can make my life simplified, I can cut out stimuli, because in the desert, I thought deep about this, I figured in the desert there's no stimuli, so I gotta reduce stimuli, maybe, you know, that, that's good enough, and I couldn't really fast, I had to go to work, I would fast on the weekends, like, from sun up to sun down, uh, at night I would eat, you know, but I cut out all the soda and everything. Not that that stuff is bad, but God doesn't want you to cut out the bad. He wants you not to do the bad. He Fasting is when you take what you enjoy and you don't do it, you know, as a sacrifice. Almost like, hey, you know, God, God I'm going to not do this and I want this in return, you know, kind of a thing. But I didn't even know all that back then. I just, you know, fasted, like I said, maybe one to two days a week on the weekend, like from morning to night. But that's not even the point. You don't even have to do that, but the important thing is I was asking God for two things. I was asking Him for the Holy Spirit, because I was asking Him for a new self until I read, ask for the Holy Spirit. So I started asking for the Holy Spirit. And I read, I also asked, it said, seek the kingdom of heaven. And so I was asking God at night, God, you know, please take me to heaven. I don't want to wake up in this world anymore. I'm sick and tired of it. You know, I can't imagine... 40 more, 50 more, 60 more years of this is like a prison sentence almost. Like I felt like I was in prison saying, get me out. You know, I came to my wit's end. Especially that I cut out all the fun. Once the music, the TV, once everything stopped, I found myself kind of like getting over emotional about things and I didn't have a release. I did work out, though I did go to work out a little bit, but I felt like you know, the simplicity was too much, almost like I was used to the chaos, and so I was a few times, few nights where tears came down, you know, uh, they, they hit, hit the Bible in there somewhere, and uh, I kept reading and asking and reading and asking, and I had set apart a certain amount of reading every day, you know, I was going to read the whole thing, and I set apart five to ten pages a day, I told myself, it's the minimum, so I held to that. And nothing happened. Nothing happened till about three weeks into it. In the book of Hebrews, which is near the end, uh, at the end, near near Revelations. And one of my buddies came over that I used to go partying with, smoking weed with, doing ecstasy with. 
uh, about a year before that, like, it was my last time, and he came over, he called me, he said, do you want to go partying? I'm like, nah, and my other friend called, he goes, you want to go drinking? I go, nah, and it was at a time where I was about to give up, I was at the Book of Hebrews, I looked up, I said, well, nothing's happening, God, are you there? I hope you're there, you know, I want this Holy Spirit, I want the living water at this point, I was asking for the living water, because it said the living water will burst forth from within, and from your belly, and from the belly, to me, was an interesting thing Jesus said, because I was really into Bruce Lee, and the chi, the chi from the belly that they called it, this, you know, and Bruce Lee was into water, and anyway, so it caught my eye, so I'm asking for this living water, and I'm asking for the Holy Spirit, and I'm asking for heaven, actually, I'm going to bed, Every night now, imagining heaven, I'm closing my eyes, whatever it might be like, I'm just, I'm hoping to be taken out of this world, every night, okay? And, uh, now when my friend came over, like three, three and a half weeks into this, and I'm in Hebrews, he came over, and he came over unannounced, and, uh, he's like, well, you want to party? I'm like, no, he's like, well, he asked my mom if he could spend the night, she said yes, and so I couldn't really tell him to get out, even though I didn't want to, I wanted some solitude, I been seeking solitude for a few weeks in my room after work and uh, so yeah we hung out we played video games he smoked some weed out on my balcony I told him you know I'm done with that for now you know like he saw it on my shelf in a ziploc he's like what are you doing I'm like well you know I'm not touching it for now you know I didn't tell him anything about what I was doing because in Matthew 6 6 Jesus said in secret ask you know and in your room don't pray in the synagogue which is church in your room so I kept it, you know, a secret. You know, we had some fun, whatever. He went to sleep. He crashed out on my bed, and uh, so I know I went and I, you know, I started asking for the Holy Spirit, the living water. And at this point, I was reading on the ground. I would get face down on the ground. I would actually humble myself, not at first, and then it said, "He who lowers himself will be exalted." And I, so I figured, let me go low, you know. And I noticed that as I do bow and ask, there's a big difference in my spirit like I felt humble it's obviously humbling when you go down so I did that in secret you know I went down I used to actually imagine Jesus standing in front of me and just like not that I believed in Jesus it was like I, I hoped that it was true like a you know slight like a hope like a wish you know so that's all it was mere hope you know and uh and I was reading the Bible, you know, like the New Testament, and I had gotten to the end. I was persistent. It said you got to search persistently, diligently, and boldly. And it said boldly you have to ask. And it gave an example of the man asking for bread from another man, uh, his friend. And it said he doesn't receive the bread at first, but because of his boldness and his persistence, he will get the bread. And the last three nights of me asking... Before my friend came over, I would drive to the Angel's Crest National Forest, which is the mountains, and at night after work, and I would just, I would get a flashlight, I would read some of my Bible there after work, and that, those last three nights, I, this thought popped in my head, let me actually scream for this, nothing is happening, nothing has happened for 24 days, you know, like I came to a point where I was like, God, hello? Father, you there, Jesus? You know, like, almost like a little smart ass, you know? But, uh, you know, I was like, if you are there, I want this living water. And I would, like, yell to the top of my lungs. It would feel liberating, but nothing happened, you know? But little did I know that God was there. And uh, that's why in Matthew, I think it says that the kingdom of heaven is taken by force. And violent people have been taking heaven by force, and it's been advancing. Uh, forceful people have been advancing it and like even on the way back nothing had happened all this time and I was thinking damn it man ah and I was like one night I kind of hit my windshield yeah, I punched it cut my hand I had a Jeep I cracked it and I was like damn you know like kind of let out some stress stress of nothing happening like frustration you know so now you cut to that night that my friend was over you know I woke up that next morning and I was positive, like I had my friend like this, about to hit him, on the ground saying, you put ecstasy in my water, I know you did, I mean, I did it a year ago, I know what it feels like, and this is actually stronger maybe, and turns out that night, 10 hours, 15 hours after we woke up, he left, and that feeling just grew a little, you know, it didn't get any lower, 
And I had a dream of Jesus, 50 feet tall or something in my dream, walking down my street in a white robe, releasing seven stars from his hand. And that was the first of many dreams of him, and actually I had visions of him too. I don't talk about these visions. They're not dreams, they're awake. And uh, they also saw a few of them asleep. I might make some videos later, but they seem to dissuade people. People seem to say, oh, you must be nuts, or this or that. And, you know, I wasn't even fasting or anything when I happened, you know, all, most of them. Maybe one of them I was fasting, but the rest of them, no. And they did stop. It was only at the beginning. But the dreams haven't stopped. He pretty much, like, nightly talks to me. And he's in me, man. Jesus Christ, like it says at the end of John, Father, I pray that those that do believe, as I am in you, let them be in me. And let us all be one with one another. He says that many times, even in Revelations, he says, For those who overcome, I will come inside and dine with you and you with me. And that's literal, folks. Jesus Christ wants to be one with your spirit. He wants you to want him to be one with your spirit. He wants you to not ask for signs, but ask only for the Holy Spirit. Only for the living water. Diligently read these 200 pages, and that's all it is, folks. So I pray to the Father right now that whoever hears this, Consider to read the New Testament asking for the living water and Holy Spirit to make Christ one with you If you can't say you're one with God and Christ that they live in you. I pray you find. Goodbye Hey, so I just want to share my testimony um, I'm an ex masturbator. I don't have the X shirt, but I get that son. So I just want to share a um, little piece of my testimony um started masturbating was about, I guess, in elementary school age. Back then, I didn't really know what that was, but it was just something to do, and it felt good, so I just kept doing it. Um, and this was, like, before I was a Christian. Like, I first heard the gospel when I was 12 years old, um, and a preacher was like, oh, if you die today, would you go to heaven or hell? And I was like, shoot, I don't know. So I ran down there, and they were just telling me a whole bunch of stuff I didn't really understand. But I wanted to love Christ, and since that day, I was just between this line, just toting this line between Christianity, living a Christian life, and living for myself. Um, so through all those years, still masturbating, not really knowing that's what it was called um, for years, but... I kind of figured that it was wrong because I had to hide in my room to do it. So, but it never occurred to me to stop. And even if I tried to, I couldn't. So, just kept on doing it. But as when I got to college, like that changed because I had different avenues instead of masturbation. And it turned from masturbation into sexual promiscuity with different guys so it kind of led into that but God has a standard that says all sexual immorality uh, people who do sexual immorality um, they have no place in his kingdom so but I still wasn't following his standard I was just like oh you know I heard about Christ when I was 12 yeah I kind of accepted it I was baptized I'm saved I can do what I want uh no God has a certain standard, his word, and it's, that's what we're supposed to live on. And I didn't get that. So, and it wasn't until after college, after going through a whole mess of stuff, that I cried out to God. I was like, God, I don't want to live this life anymore. I want to live for you, and I don't care what it takes. I'm tired of this life. I had no peace. I was just crying all the time, had no peace, I turned to alcohol, I turned to a whole bunch of things, and I, I had no avenues to go, and I couldn't tell anybody, because who am I supposed to tell? People, like, girls don't talk about masturbation, and that's like something you don't really hear about. So, I had no one to turn to, and I finally realized, oh, I should turn to God. So, um... Turned to God and I was like, God, if you just please help me. I just want to get out of this lifestyle. I want to live for you. I don't care. And last year, um, I completely surrendered my life to God. And how that 
looks is it's not just saying you're not going to do this anymore, you're not going to do this anymore, you're not going to do this anymore. That's not, that's not it. That's, that's not it. Like, you're surrendering your whole life to God, not just not doing a couple of things anymore. Because there are good people out there who don't drink, who don't have sex outside of marriage. They don't do half of the things that I did, but they're still not living for God. They're still, they don't care what God says. They're living for themselves. They're doing all these things to say that, oh, they're a good person. But the word says that nobody is good. Everyone is a sinner. Everyone falls short of the glory of God. And God is the only way to heaven. Jesus died on the cross for us. And he is the only way that we can enter into heaven by believing in what he did on the cross. He saved us from all our sins. He saved us from all of that. And then believing in him and accepting his free gift of grace is how we enter this relationship with him. And that's what God wants. God wants us to love him with all our heart. Not love ourselves, not love the things of, these, of this world. So at that point I had realized that and I was just completely broken. I was like, God, if you can take me as I am, I want to love you with all of me. So... From that day on, that's what I've been trying to do. And I just wanted to share that with you guys today. Um, Alright, so if you have any questions, you can email me. Put my email in the um, description box. Um, and alright, have a nice day. I once had a conversation with the doctor at a medical meeting. And she was Jewish. And she was very angry with me when she discovered that I had become a Christian. And even though I tried to explain to her that I'm still Jewish, I'm still probably more proud to be Jewish than I ever was, that I believe that Jesus was my Jewish Messiah, that, that uh, even though the Jewish community is mad at me, I don't feel that I'm a traitor to Judaism, that I'm practicing real Judaism. I, I feel completed in my Judaism. She, she stayed angry. And I'll never forget, I looked at her and I said to her, you know, Doc, you went to four years of medical school. You then probably spent four or five years in training after medical school to become an expert doctor in the field that you're in. How many minutes or hours have you ever spent in the Bible learning what God has to say? And she was essentially speechless because she had to admit that even though she was angry at me, she knew very little about what was in the Bible and what was even in her Judaism. And, and yet she was basing her eternity on no knowledge, and yet she spent nine years to become an expert to practice medicine. And I said, don't you see a problem here? Don't you see that there is a problem that you have not ever actually done what I did? Sit down with the Hebrew Scriptures, sit down with the New Testament, look at the promises of God, learn who God is, and see if this Jesus fits what our Jewish Messiah was prophesied to do. I said, you owe that to yourself, and yet you've, only, you've not even spent minutes doing that. There's something wrong with this. I don't know whatever happened with her, but hopefully I started her on a path towards truth. Um, and I just wanted to um, give my testimony and give my faith in Jesus Christ, uh, my Lord and Savior. Um, in 2007 or 2008, I'm not, I can't exactly recall, but it was before President Obama was elected, so it was probably 2007. Um, I have this feeling of impending doom, just a real overwhelming feeling of impending doom, and I didn't understand why I had it. Around this time, my youngest sister, who's five years younger than me, um, had um, been experiencing issues with her kidneys. Um, ten years prior to that, she had had a kidney transplant, and her kidneys were starting to go bad again, and um, her health was starting to fail. And so I, I just sort of associated um, the feeling of impending doom with the possibilities that I was just worried about 
um, her dying. And so um, I started questioning, you know, uh, what happens when you die? Um, is there life after death? And I, I just started really thinking about this because at the time, back then, I was watching things like Ghosts um, Among Us or, you know, those paranormal shows. I was watching a lot of that, and um, I, I believed in the supernatural. It wasn't really hard for me to believe. I, I knew of Jesus. I believed in Jesus. Um, I called myself a Christian. I thought I was a Christian um, because compared to other people, I thought I was a good person, and I thought that was enough. Um, and so basically what happened was, um, you know, I, I started to look on the Internet, I know, of all places, right? But that's where we kind of all go um, when we want to look for an answer, right? And so, um, you know, I started to see all these things about, like, aliens. And so I started questioning, you know, how do aliens, if we are all created in the image of God, how do aliens really play into all of this? I wasn't really quite sure. And so... You know how amazing God is, right? He he says that when um, you start to seek him, you will find him. So I was seeking him, and he was drawing me closer to himself without me even realizing it because he knows how to reach us. He knows how to get to us, right? And so basically, um, as I was flipping the channels that night, you know, um, and, and just pondering all these things, I came upon... Um, an infomercial of this psychic guy of all things promoting his book ghosts among us and I thought wow who better to know about the afterlife than someone who talks to the dead and so um, I immediately ordered the book and as soon as I got it I mean I, I couldn't put it down I had to finish reading it I read it it made perfect sense you know um, and, of course, I had never really read the Bible or anything like that. So I, I didn't really know at the time that this was not something that, you know, the Lord was okay with. Um, but anyway, I read the book and I thought, wow, this makes really good sense. It's just what I believe, that all good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. And I'm a good person, so I'm okay. And so I called my sister, my youngest sister. She's five years younger than me. And she's the one that was going to have the kidney, you know, transplant or, uh, you know, she was having the problems. And so I called her up and I said, oh, I just read the most amazing book. You don't have to worry. Um, you don't need to be afraid, this and that and the other. Um, you need to read it. And so I started telling her about the book. And she said, you know, that's great, Tricia. Well, keep in mind, my youngest sister is five years younger than I am. And she said, that's great, but I am I need to work out my own salvation with God. I need to make sure that I'm going to go into heaven. And she says, I'm reading more Christian books. And I said, okay, well, you know, what are you reading? And so she read it off a couple of books, none of which really got my attention, except one the very last one that she had mentioned. And a friend of her had given her a book, um, 23 Minutes in Hell. And she started telling me about the book, about this Christian man that had been Christian for a very long time, very um, active in the church. And he had an experience where he went to sleep and then his soul descended into hell. And the Lord allowed him to experience what hell is like for an unsaved soul. And she just, you know, went on to describe the demons and things like that. And I was intrigued. That got my attention. Because I had been watching things like that, you know, with the whole supernatural and all that. So thinking, at first I had two, two reactions. I said, what kind of friend would give you a book like that? You're a good person. You don't need to be worrying about going there. And she said, Trisha, you really, you should consider reading. And I said, well, I think I will. Because I'm, you know, it, you know, I'm thinking, I'm a good person. not going to affect me. I'll read it. So I did. I immediately got the book. And I began to read it. And as I began to read it, he started using scripture. And I grabbed my Bible. I dusted it off. 
and I would open my Bible and I would look for that scripture and I would read what was above it and below that scripture. And I just sort of started questioning even more things. And the things that he described in the book, um, you know, started to kind of stir things up in me. And I realized that there was a lot more going on. You know, he had mentioned in his book that, you know, it's not good enough to just be a good person. It's not good enough to just call yourself a Christian. And I started to sort of question then how how do you not end up there in hell? And at the time, I didn't realize that, you know, I was headed there. Uh, I'm still in the mindset of, um, this is not going to happen to me. I'm not, I'm not going there. And then um, as I was finishing the book, he had mentioned someone else that had experienced the same thing, uh, Mary Kay Baxter. She, he didn't mention her by name, but, you know, towards the end of the book, I was able to look it up. Um, Anyway, so I saw um, that her book was Divine Revelations of Hell and immediately bought it and started reading it. So through all of this, hindsight is always twenty twenty, and I can see that God was just, through all of this, drawing me closer and closer to himself because he loves me. And when I began to read Mary Kay Baxter's Divine Revelation of Hell, she is pleading with the reader, you know, beloved, you know, these things are faithful and true. And she gave scripture for all of the things that the Lord had revealed to her in hell, in the pits. And what was so unique about this book was that the Lord revealed to her, okay, why the people were in the pits. What got them there to begin with. I was in sheer shock when I found out that there are other people like myself. I started to see myself in one of those pits. There are people there that call themselves Christians, that they knew of Jesus but didn't have a relationship with Jesus. I didn't read the Bible. I didn't go to church except on Thanksgiving and holidays, Christmas, and, and, and you know, for um, Passover. And, um, you know, I, I was a, you know, I was of the world. You know, I I went out to clubs, I hung out with my girlfriends, we, we, you know, we'd do all these things, and I mean, just very worldly, you know, and I, um, and, uh, when I started to see myself in the pits, as she's, you know, all the time just begging the reader, you know, reader, this is real, the Lord showed this to me, reader, I don't want you to go there, she would call us a beloved, and, um, and something began to stir in me after I, you know, had the vision of myself being in the pits. Because how, now I'm thinking, I don't know how to go to heaven. I don't know how to end up in heaven. And so, basically, I began to weep. I began to weep from the pits of my, my soul, my stomach. I just began to weep and weep and weep. And I cried out to God and I said, oh God. God, I don't know how to be saved. Save me. Come into my heart. Lord Jesus, I don't want to end up in the pits of hell. And I began to just weep and weep and weep. And at that moment, I felt this like warmth come over me. Like oil. Just just this warmth that came over from my head all the way down to my toes. And I felt this peace. And my heart was racing. And I was weeping, just weeping bitterly over my sins. I felt ashamed. I felt exposed before God. And as this warmth is all consuming, I, I, I hear something in my spirit. Not like an audible, I don't know how to explain it exactly, but I heard something that says, You are a new creation. Sin no more. And I, oh, I just cried even more. I was like, how do I not sin? How do I not sin? My nature is sinful. Oh, dear God, save me. And I will try and be faithful. You know, I will try not to sin anymore. I will follow you all the days of my life. Dear God, save me. You know? And then something else was like, the bridegroom is coming. Now, keep in mind, I hadn't been reading the Bible. I 
and I had no idea what the bridegroom was. Um, and so when I heard that, I, w I was a little confused. I was just very emotional. I was crying. Um, and I, I became born again. You know, how, have you ever watched that movie, The Grinch Stole Christmas? You know, at the very end when his heart gets two sizes too big? Well, that's what my heart felt like. My heart, I asked Jesus into my heart, and it felt like my heart had gotten two sizes too big because it had hurt for like, it had hurt for like a week or so, you know, and I knew I was baptized with the Holy Spirit because, you know, the day before in my car I was jamming to that Katy Perry song, you know, I kissed a girl and I liked it, and I was just jamming to it, and then um, the next day, as I had gotten into my car, I heard that same song, and it just offended my spirit altogether. I had to turn it off. I couldn't listen to secular music anymore. I, I hungered. I mean, I just couldn't get enough of the Bible, Christian music. Um, I, I, I had not been attending a church, so I didn't know where to go. I had gone to, um, I had taken my kids, and I put packed them up in the car, you know, I had all these brand new feelings. You know, everybody in my family thought I was crazy. I'd just, like, gone nuts or something. And I'm like, Jesus is coming soon. Jesus said he's coming soon. The bridegroom is coming. You know, and um, I said, you got to get ready. And I was telling everybody I knew about heaven and about hell and how it's a real place. And how we don't want to, you know, we you don't want to go there. And how narrow is the way to salvation through Jesus Christ alone and so I began to develop um, a relationship with the Lord and um, I lost a lot of friends or people that I thought were my friends a lot of people thought I was weird um, and uh, but I won't give up Jesus I won't give up Jesus I can lose everybody I'm not giving up my Jesus Jesus is the only way he is the truth and a life and without him, there is no life. There is none other. There is but God and his son, Jesus Christ. And um, I am thankful that he has changed my life. To God be the glory. He is coming soon. And he's coming for a pure and holy righteous bride. And with all the things that are happening right now, we need to be on our knees and in prayer, especially for our loved ones who are not saved. And we need to just not be afraid to tell others about Jesus. He is alive. We should not be afraid. Anyway, I pray that you're encouraged and this is my first video. Um, Anyway, God bless, and thank you for listening. Tony Davis was a young rhythm and blues singer who followed the path of many aspiring musicians. I moved from Orlando, Florida to Los Angeles seeking to sing R&B. Tony's dreams of stardom just weren't coming true, so he turned to God for help. I went to praying right there. I said, something got to happen. I know, God, if you're real, please help me. Help me get out of this. I gave my life to Christ right there. I changed my life around. And I said, you know what? I want to start to sing for the Lord. I want to do gospel. Tony started a new career as a gospel singer. He thought his life was back on track. That is, until the night he went to pick up his wife. I came just to pick up my wife from work. And when I pulled up to the house where she worked, bullets start to ring out from behind me. The first bullet hit my left leg, my thigh area, and I turned to run. And as I turned to run, two more bullets followed and hit, hit my leg again. And I ran and I fell down beside my car. And all of a sudden, another young man came from the other side, the front side, and he started to shoot me all over again. A bullet hit my right side thigh area. Another bullet hit the ground and came up through my leg. All of a sudden, the bullet went across my face, my chest, and I said, enough, in the name of Jesus. And a young man was standing behind a tree, and he had the gun pointing towards my head. And I said, why? What have I done to make you shoot me like this? You don't even know me. What have I done? 
and his hand began to tremble and he lowered the gun. At that point, I knew I was going to die. It was too much blood. One of the bullets shattered Tony's main artery. He bled to death right there on the street. His wife, Criselda, ran outside when the shooting stopped. When I went there, he was, um, he was laid out shot in his blood. I actually saw myself that the ambulance was giving him CPR and inside. I asked to go with him and they would not take me because they was doing CPR to try to bring him back. I started to float towards these clouds. Um, these clouds opened up and through these clouds I saw this huge city. Um, it was so strange, but the city was beautiful, man. Was, I saw these colors I've never seen before in my life. These strange, just glowing colors, radiant colors just glooming out of, of this huge city. All of a sudden this voice said, it's not yet your time, go back. And I'm like, no, 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 no way. He said my name, Tony. Your work is not yet done. Go back. The doctor had already pronounced him dead. I opened my eyes and I looked up and I was on life support. This thing was in my throat. This long tube with a trait was in my throat. And this doctor was standing over me and he was about to throw this sheet over my head. But he dropped the sheet and he ran out the room. Doctors and nurses ran to his room. They was checking me and they couldn't believe. They said, you know, you was dead for 30 minutes. And usually when you, you know, after a few minutes of death, you, you know, they expected me to have brain damage. Tony was alive, but the doctor had some disappointing news for him. And the doctor was telling me, we sorry, but we had to cut your throat immediately to try to get air into your body. So we cut your throat and we mistakenly cut a piece of your vocal cord. So what we can do at this point is um, we can put a box on the side of your throat and you can talk through this box. And they told him they may have to amputate his left leg. And unfortunately, the artery put in your left leg is not working properly. It's not sitting right in the leg. I was mad with God because I asked God, why did he let something like this happen to a good person that's trying to serve him? But Tony says he held on to his faith in God. I've served God in spirit and in truth. And in, in that, I believe that he's going to show up and heal me. I believe that Jesus said by his stripes, we are healed. That's in the Bible. And I believe that he's going to heal me. And I'm going to stand on that only. Tony prayed for a miracle and says he got it that very night. And all of a sudden, I felt this warmthness come into that room. It came into the room, a, war, a, a nice warmness, and it touched my leg, and I felt it go up to the artery, and I felt like stuff was being mingled together in my leg, and all of a sudden it went up to my throat. Tony says that while God healed his body, he was also working on his heart. You must forgive, is what God said in my spirit. And I'm like, no, you got to be kidding me. Why should I forgive those guys that shot me like this? And he said again, you must forgive. And when he said that, I said, you know what? This is a choice for me. I'm going to forgive. It's not a feeling, but it's a choice. So therefore, I forgive. Police told Tony he was probably the victim of a local gang initiation. I really strongly believe in my heart that it was a miracle because the way that my husband was shot, it's, I, I see that people comes in the hospital when he was in there with one bullet in their, their body, they die. He had five bullets and he never, he didn't, he died, but God brought him back for a reason. Tony is still singing gospel and says that wherever he goes, he wants people to understand the power of God's love. I know and I truly believe when the scripture says that not even death can separate us from his love. I think about how he touched me and brought me back to life, how he gave me my joy back and my strength back and my faithfulness to him. It just, I mean, I'm just totally overwhelmed with his grace and his mercy. Serve God, love me and man. This is not the end. Live unbruised, we are friends. None 
As a, as a Jewish person, you're really taught that Jesus is not for the Jewish people. And it's really based on tradition. It's not scriptural. It's just frustrating for me that, the, that many Jewish people, including myself, you know, I, I remember that I was this way too. I just didn't want to hear. You know, I didn't want to look. I didn't want to read. You know, the New Testament? No, that's not for me. I'm Jewish. I don't need that. When you encounter the fact that Jesus may be the Messiah, you might think automatically you put a wall up because that's what you're taught to do. Well, I thank God that He's bigger than that wall and His Holy Spirit works in our lives and our hearts to pull down that wall because He loves us so much. Whether you're Jewish or not, you need to know the Messiah. And if you don't know who you are, or where you're going, where you come from, your sense of identity is being discovered along the way. Whoever you are, wherever you're going, whatever you do, just know that God made you and God wants to have a relationship with you. And I thank God that He came in the form of a man, Yeshua, to show us that love. And now, it's, you know, when you come to that revelation, that point in your life, when, when you truly believe that, God pulls down that veil that separates you from Him and allows you to really know the truth, the depth, the height, the width of His love. And it's such an amazing place to walk in. It's really why we were created. I believe God is a personal God. And I believe that He is interested in having a relationship with you. And I truly believe that if you ask Him to reveal Himself to you in any way that you would be able to see, I believe He'll do that. It is such a Jewish thing to believe in the Messiah, HaMashiach, Yeshua. Don't let people 
be what keeps you away from your God. To have a relationship with the one who holds the very fabric of time and space together. Hey everybody, it's your girl. I'm back at you. It's been a while since I've made a little video. It's not going to be long, but I just want to share a little testimony with you guys. Um, and hopefully it encourages you and you're able to really search your own hearts um, and break free. So this um, little section is going to be on an addiction. Addictions, you guys. Now, addictions can go from drugs as the most known use. Drugs, alcohol, sex. Yeah, it is an addiction. Mm-hmm. It's addiction, you guys. Um, what? Fighting can be an addiction. Arguing. Um, masturbation. Um, the list goes on and on and on. But for today, and for myself, I'm going to be talking about... See if I can write this down for you guys. Okay. My addiction was. Can you see that? My writing looks kind of crazy, but. Porn. And the way that I overcame it was through Christ and the Holy Spirit. Period. I could not do it by myself. I've tried, I've tried, I've tried. That does not mean that I did not fall, but I made it and I'm still making it. And um, I'm going to share with y'all my testimony. I was introduced to sex at a very young age, at the age of five. I was introduced to sex and um, porn and everything else came with it. Um, I was really screwed up for real. Um, I didn't, I didn't have any sense of, you know, when something happens, you like this ain't right, you know. I didn't have any of that for pornography. Um, it became a way of life. If you watched the Looney Tunes, Nickelodeon, Rugrats, Hey Arnold, whatever you used to watch as a kid. Just like you would flip it on and just sit there and watch it, it was the same thing. There was no sense of this is wrong. Um, none of that was present because I was introduced at a very young age and taught that it was okay. When I got saved, um, that all changed. But before then, I'm going to back you up a little bit. Before then, I noticed the porn be start becoming a big part of my life. Um, and the enemy knew that and when I say the enemy yes I do mean Satan if I believe in Jesus Christ and God then I do believe in Satan he's real you know um, but when I got about 14, 15 even though I wasn't having sex even though my heart really wasn't ready for all of that my mind was messed up. Messed up. With any addiction, it don't matter what it is. Any addiction you have, um, it progresses. No addiction stays the same. I know in school they tell you, you smoke weed, you'll end up going on crack, or you'll end up doing this. And a lot of people butt against that. But one thing I do know is if you're addicted to them things, they don't stay the same. Nothing stays the same. Only thing that I know for real that stays the same is God. And I don't mean to sound cliche or anything like that, but I can just speak from my heart and what I've been through. And at that age of 17, 16, that spirit, pornography, bondage, began to flourish. Um, I can just think back on how 
I just thought it was okay. I really did. I thought it was okay. And in the beginning, it starts off with man and woman. It don't stay that way. I was introduced when I was five. By the time that I was 13, you see stuff, woman and woman and man and man and orgies and it goes on. Some people it gets to watching people be raped. Some people it gets to animals. Some people it get, and you will look at these things and be like, ew, you nasty, you know. But there's no strength. There's nothing to fight that stuff off. And then your heart you know it's wrong, but you have nobody enforcing that it's wrong. No one has ever told you that it's wrong. It's hard to make that decision by yourself. And um you know, so it got worse. And it was something that I thought was normal. I never desired to partake in those things. But you know, if I wasn't doing it, then I felt like I was good. Anything you see and hear is not a big deal. You hear and see stuff every day. And for me, those spirits rang heavy in my life because I was molested not only by men, but by women as well. Um, so seeing homosexual acts was cool with me. It was like, okay, well, and even though I never partaked in my heart, never desired the same sex, or that wasn't even me, it was something that wasn't taboo to me, though. But um, when I got to school, I didn't get saved three months when I arrived to Norfolk State. I got saved. That's the first thing that God addressed that I needed to change. Oh my God, what? Did he really open my eyes and tell me how wrong it was, you guys? Like... To be honest, I've been at points where I got angry because I didn't know how to cope without it. Um, and that's why even to this day, I can never look at an addict, can never look at a crackhead, can never look at an alcoholic and put my nose up. Like, who are you to do that? You know, if you've never been through anything that's addictive, you can even be in addictive relationships. Like, you really got to check yourself. And, um, it's something once you find out that it's wrong, it's like, how do I turn away from this? And even when I tried to turn away, I would have dreams about it. As soon as I made up my mind, I'm not going back to this bondage, I would have dreams on a daily basis about this issue. Everywhere I turned, when I was awake, I was being tempted by something or someone. Um, it's times I've been on the computer, other people's computers, brand new computers, stuff will come up. And I'd be like sitting there looking crazy, like what, you know. Um, was crazy y'all <laughs> really was crazy and um I remember I went to my sister and I cried out to her and I was like I need to be free I have to be free because I can only go but so far in Christ and every time I fall I feel like I'm losing myself and um I was in a relationship at the time and I'm still in this relationship and to be honest he didn't deserve that and he didn't understand it in the beginning I talked to him about it he knew about it but I don't believe he knew how strong cold like how strong it was on me um, and he would say you know whenever you get those urge call me I drop everything and we'll pray or we'll talk and I help you try to get your mind off of it but after I felt so much I didn't want to hurt him I didn't want him to be disgusted. And he was never, you know, you always hear with dudes. Dudes watch it all the time and it's good. 
you never hear of women. That's something that was so shameful for me, being a woman. He, my boyfriend wasn't even into that stuff. He didn't like that stuff. He just wasn't into it. But through a lot of trial and error, I noticed the most times I got tempted is when a lot of stuff was going on in my life. I learned it was a coping mechanism that I ran into. And one thing I noticed about addictions is when I was born, my parents were Christians. I was baptized as a baby. I went to church as a little kid. So it's not, it's not as though I had no exposure to Christianity and then learned about it. I, I was a Christian, and then it was, it was taken away from me. It was suppressed. And it was, it was easier at, at some point to just to be an atheist, which is what I, I said I was for years. I really just didn't want to think about anything religious, which is understandable given what I've seen. I didn't want to think that that was real and that had any power, so I didn't want to think that God was real and God had any power either. I just wanted to pretend it wasn't there. Eventually, I came to realize that that wasn't working. Over years of experience, over becoming a mother, struggling with being a mother, with my feelings of guilt over my abortions, with my feelings of guilt over the over birth control, over everything else that I had done, there was no way to deal with that. There was no way to deal with guilt for, for anything wrong that I had done. There was no way to deal with, with, with feeling guilty for, for yelling at someone or anything. There was no way to be forgiven. There's no forgiveness in atheism. Sins, evils, bad things you've done, whatever you want to call it, they just stack up. It just stacks up and stacks up and stacks up. There's guilt on you and you can't get rid of it. There's no way to make things right between two people. You know, if I do something that hurts you, there's nothing, there's, there's no way for you to forgive me. There's no way for me to feel forgiven. There's just, there's just, there, there would be something bad between us now. And that just stays there if you're an atheist. Um, I also, my sons are both um, autistic and have other developmental disabilities and I realized that the value system of atheism and rationalism that I was trying to live in didn't, didn't allow for that. Um, prominent atheists like Richard Dawkins, like Peter Singer, people like that who really are the voices of the modern atheist movement, in their opinion, children like mine should be killed. Not, not just aborted, not just prevented. In, in, as far as Peter Singer is concerned, it would be okay to kill them now. It would be okay to just drop them off at the defective child euthanasia center and that that's what should be done instead of providing special education, instead of therapy, instead of my husband and I working every day to parent them, to support them, to help them grow to the best of their abilities, whatever that is, whether that's lesser or different than an average person, doesn't matter. We love them, we want to take care of them, but there was no, there was no support for that. I was looking around online atheist communities for support for parents of disabled children, and. What I got was, we need euthanasia. This is why we need euthanasia, is for children like yours. It's unfair that, you're, that you should be wasting your time raising these children. You should be able to kill them and get on with your life. My sadness over my loss of fertility wasn't respected either. It was, well, if you produce two defective children, then it's best that you can't reproduce again. You know, these are, these are very... I, I learned that in some ways I wasn't cut out to be an atheist. I'm. I'm too nice. These are very, very cold, very bitter, very harsh people, and I didn't fit in with them. And what I felt like doing with my life, being a stay-at-home mother, taking care of disabled children, didn't fit in with what atheism thought I ought to be doing. They didn't respect my husband and I's desire for a traditional family structure. Traditional values aren't necessarily tied to Christianity. They, they just make sense. It makes sense that children should have a mother. To me, at least, it made sense that children should have a mother and father who were married and committed to each other. It made sense that parents should love and care for their children no matter what their children were. If their children are disabled, if they're... Wh whatever happens, you should love your children and care for your children. And these weren't the values of the atheist community. So I started wondering, if Christians have all these other things right, Maybe, maybe they do have the spiritual side of things right, too. I'd always had a bit of a sentimental attachment to my church experiences as a child. I had tried to go back to church 
right after my abortion when I was seeking post-abortion healing and my dad's minister actually told me that since I had identified as an atheist that I had no business in a church, that I could never be reconciled to God and that I was not welcome to go back. So that that did set me back for another decade or so. That kept me out of church. I, you know, not, not, not all Christians are saints, just like not all atheists are horrible people. My husband is still not a believer, but he's a wonderful husband and father. So around last year, I really hit a, a breaking point in my life I started feeling like I couldn't like I couldn't go on like what was the point of living what was what was the point of living when I had these children that were reviled and useless I I myself was obviously defective for having had them I had been having a lot of other problems just depression that wouldn't go away I had taken antidepressants I had been to counseling nothing was working I started looking for post-abortion healing because I realized that every year around the anniversary of my abortion I would get extremely depressed and I realized that I couldn't I, I couldn't just go on like that every year every year spending September and the next few months in despair I couldn't do it so all the post-abortion healing websites of course said that healing begins with Jesus and I thought well that's but that's not an option for me but but I can't do that he's not gonna accept me and finally, after a few months of studying, of reading the Bible, of reading, I bought a Bible and started reading it, and I started reading these websites, and eventually one, one afternoon I just said, I just, I prayed. You know, I just prayed extemporaneously, and I said, okay, Jesus, if you're there, and if you're really real, and if you really want to, ex and if I'm actually acceptable to you, even with all the things I've done and said in my life, even though I don't think I should be acceptable to you, if you want to accept me, I'm yours. And I felt what I now recognize as the Holy Spirit. It's the only way I can describe it. I instantly felt something. I felt a, a, like almost like, like I was glowing or tingling. It was a strange feeling that I'd never had before. And I felt that, that my prayer had been answered, that I was accepted. I started looking for a church I found a church, I, I've ended up going to a few churches now, and I found one I'm, I'm comfortable and at home in, and I started, God changed me in a lot of ways instantly. I didn't realize that would happen. I always thought that, it, that belief was just something you talked yourself into. People said, oh, I believe in God, and then I think I'm a better person than you. I didn't realize that it actually did things to people. That was a shock, realizing that it really did change me, that I would wake up in the morning and not be depressed. That I would wake up in the morning and just get up and be happy and be able to do things that I had confidence I didn't have before. That rather than just being, being pro-life in my ideas and maybe giving some money to pro-life organizations, voting pro-life, that I, I wanted to speak out. I wanted to do something. I got in touch with Silent No More. I started praying at Planned Parenthood. I started talking to people and here I am. What's up everybody? My name is Asia and a lot of people know me as Fresh and I'm going to give y'all my testimony. About a couple of months ago, maybe four or five months ago, I decided to put God first in my life. And by me putting God first in my life, I had to give up a lot of things that I didn't want to give up. And homosexuality was one of those things. I always knew in my heart that it wasn't right because I was brought up in a Christian home. And I knew that it wasn't right, but I didn't want to accept it. I wanted to live my life the way I wanted to live it. And I had been gay since I could remember. And I was just like, okay, well, why would God give me this desire? Why would I have this desire if it was a sin? You know, like I, w I would justify. I was like, well, ain't no sin greater than the other. The Bible saying no sin greater than the other. We got murderers. We got killers out here. Like, what's the big deal? You know, but I had to come to realize that he's God. And God created me for a purpose. And I had to let that go because God said, it. you know, um, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 69 that homosexuals would not inherit the kingdom of God. I didn't say it. God said it, you know, and as my faith in God and believing in God, I believe 
in God. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I believe in the Holy Spirit and I believe in the Bible. And I feel like you can't take one without the other. A lot of people like to take God and don't want to accept his son. They want to take God, but they don't want to accept the word of God. They don't, they, oh, the Bible's written by man. You know, they want to come with up with all these excuses. They want to come up and justify what God has said when that's what he said. You know, we, we can't change it. You know, I, I know I've questioned it. I've, I've said everything. I've come up with everything in my mind to try to make it right. And either way, I flipped it. It was still wrong. So I just had to accept it. You know, I, I had to accept that I'm going to put God first. Because at the end, that's all I got is God. At the end, that's all that's going to matter is my relationship with God. I had to realize that this world is so temporary. Like, we all got to die one day and we all got to stand before God and give account for our lives. And my my biggest fear was for me to stand before God and God to be like, you know what, Asia, I created you for this. And you did everything you want to do. You, you went your whole life and you lived it the way you wanted to live it. You didn't go by what I told you to do. You didn't follow what I told you to do. And I had to just say, you know what, God, I give it to you. As hard as it is, I was a stud. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not just no, oh, I lied. God, forgive me. I'm sorry. This is a lifestyle. This is not only a saying. It's a lifestyle. It's a mentality. It's 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 your whole demeanor. So for me, it's hard. It, I'm not going to stand before you and say, oh, it's easy. It's a piece of cake. You can do it. Uh, you can do all things through Christ's strength, which is true, but it's a struggle. It's, it's hard. And Matthew 16 and 24 says, Jesus said, if you want to be my follower, you must pick up the cross and follow me, which meant picking up the cross, which means it's going to be hard. It's a struggle. It's it's not easy. And my whole thing is just because you have a desire to do something doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do it. I get mad at somebody. I want to bust them up across the head, but that doesn't mean I'm going to do it. You know what I'm saying? Because if I bust them all of a sudden, I bust them upside the head, I'm going to jail. I look at that as the same thing as me living a homosexual lifestyle just because I have a desire to do it doesn't necessarily mean that I have to do it and it's hard you know I'm I, I can't I can't explain but it's possible you can do it and I used to always say well yeah God won't he would change me you know what I'm saying if God want to bring me out he'll bring me out. I'm going through this reason evidently he gave me this desire for a reason I'm going through this for a reason and I used to be like, oh, God, it changed me. But I had to realize that God is a gentleman. He gives us the power of choice. God's not going to take nothing away from you that you don't want him to take away from you. You have to make that first step. I had to make that first step and say, you know what, God, I know this is not pleasing to you. I give it back to you. I give it back to you. God, take this desire from my heart. Take it out of my mind and cleanse me and make me the person that you would have me to be. And that's when I begin to grow. So it's a struggle. It, it ain't easy, but it's possible. And if you make that first step, I guarantee you God will make that second step. Um, I'm not telling my testimony to, to beat nobody across the head with the Bible and say, oh, you're going to hell if you don't change your life. No, my message to everybody, anybody, just to put God first. Put God first in your life. And a lot of people say, okay, man, you never was gay. You you don't know what it's like. You know, if you can give up homosexuality, you you ain't gay. You must like men. You must be talking to guys. Not, no, I God, I haven't brought I haven't been brought that far. I don't have a desire for men, and I feel like God is teaching me how to be alone, how to lean and depend on Him, because a lot of people don't know how to be alone. They feel like they need somebody. I need somebody. You know, they don't know how to just be alone, and they don't know how to be complete with them within themselves. So they feel like they constantly feel like they need a relationship to complete them. They don't want to be lonely. You know, so God is teaching me how to lean and depend on him, talk to him. You know, I was always in some type of relationship. Like I was always in a relationship where I was always talking to somebody. But now it's going to the point my phone don't even ring. Like I'm totally alone by myself, just me and God, because God said he'll never leave us or forsake us. So I'm learning how to strengthen my relationship with God. And I'm becoming happy with that because I'm learning so much. And God is showing me so much. And I know that he has a purpose for my life, just had just as the, just as he has a purpose for everybody else's lives, and 
I just want to say that it's possible, you know. It's possible to change. You gotta want, first you gotta want to. You gotta want in your heart to change. You gotta want to accept the fact that, hey, God said that this is wrong and I gotta change. I know if I can do it, anybody can do it. Anybody can do it. And I say this a lot. Only the strong survive. Only the strong survive. So put God first. And that's my message is just to put God first. That's my testimony. Y'all be blessed. I'm out. I was about as far removed from church as you can possibly get. Wasn't quite the Antichrist, but wasn't quite <laughs> far away from that. Yeah. Um, I'm obviously not a southerner, as you can tell by the Peter Kayish twang to my voice. Um, I'm from the north. Um, I, I grew up just outside Leeds. And um, I grew up in a, in a rough area, a rough estate, Warwick estate. It was a kind of estate, the police don't go on it after dark, buses don't run onto it after dark. If you drive through it slower than 30 mile an hour, you'll lose your wheels. And <laughs> the, um, the, I just kind of fell into, it wasn't a conscious choice, I just fell into crime at, at a really early age. Sort of 10, 11, using drugs, drinking, smoking, and getting into crime. And bizarrely, it started with a, a bit of a hobby, stealing car badges from expensive mm -hmm. cars. And so there's lots of expensive mm -hmm. cars around here. I've seen quite a few. <laughs> oh, uh... So, and I think you moved out, and eventually you did a fairly serious crime. Yeah, as my drug use grew, and I became a well-known drug dealer, and I was out and selling heroin and cocaine, and I sort of moved up the ladder. And we were turning over quite a lot of money, thousands of pounds a week. Um, there's three of us. I'm the only one left alive. One, one of my friends, I held him while he died of overdose. And the other one was shot and killed while I was in prison. And um, when I was asked that, somebody came, another associate came to me and said, do you want to get involved in an armed robbery? And I just said, yeah, well, why not? Why not? As you do. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> and um, what happened? Um, I was the driver. Um, so I went and I stole the car, crossed the border into South Yorkshire, um, stole the car and brought it back into West Yorkshire because there was at least a seven day period before South Yorkshire police would tell West Yorkshire police that the car had been stolen so you could drive round quite happily without being pulled over. So you did the robbery? And we did the robbery. We thought we'd got away with it and um, the first I knew that we hadn't got away with it was when the arm response and the dogs and the black maroyers were kicking my door down. So, yeah, it's, uh, it caught up with me in the and end. And how long were you sent to prison for? Uh, five and a half years. I did just shot and for. And when you got into prison, how, how did you respond to that? Oh, I, once I was in there and I knew I was going to be there for a while, I thought, Daryl, if you're going to be bad, you're going to be the best kind of bad you can possibly be. And I consigned myself to being as violent as I could possibly be, continuing to sell drugs while I was inside, and uh, bringing them into the prison through visits in various different ways. And I got into lots of fights, lots of violence, assaulting prison officers, spent a lot of time in segregation on 24-hour lockdown, and moved around a lot. And someone came and asked you a question. Say it about us about I was in a welding shop in HMP Walds, a Category A prison near Hull. And there was a guy coming round with a clipboard, one another inmate with a clipboard. It uh, wasn't someone I'd speak to, he was a Muppet. It wasn't... Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought he was signing people, it looked like an education program or something, and he came up to me and he said, would you like to go on an alpha course? I said, well, what's an alpha course? He said, oh, it's in the chapel. And as soon as he said chapel, I thought, oh, great, Bible basher. And I said, look, get out of my face before I slap you. And it was under no illusion that I would have slapped him, and he did the best impression of Speedy Gonzales I've ever seen. He just shot off. And, uh, but God bless him and his courage, because he came back the following day with his clipboard, and he came up to me, and I was about to dish him out the slap I'd promised him the day before, when he blurted out really quickly, you get Wednesday afternoon out of bang up, you get free coffee and you get free biscuits. <gasps> I said, I'll see you on Wednesday, sunshine. And I think you took one or two people with you? I did. I went around the workshop and I rounded up all my mates from the workshop and said, come on, lads, we're going on Alpha. Mm -hmm. it, was my, uh, it was my first evangelistic mm -hmm. act and my outreach event all <laughs> rolled into one. And what happened to you on Alpha? When I arrived there, I don't know what I was expecting, but I wasn't expecting what I found. There was a chaplain from the prison, and the other two people running the course, it was two retired nuns. How old have you got to be to be a retired nun? <laughs> it was less age concern and more mummy returns. <laughs> it was... And what was it that got you about those two women? These two ladies... Oh, we just, we laid into them. We gave them a hard time. The usual stuff. God doesn't exist. Even if he did, what's he ever done for me? What do you know about life? You've been in the nunnery for 50 years. What can you tell me about living? 
But these two ladies, they just came back at us and never got angry, not once. And they came back at us with love and compassion over and over again. These two girls were, were just love bombs. And they just, <laughs> they just kept on loving, kept on coming with the compassion. And that's a pretty big sledgehammer to get hit with, especially... I thought I would never feel anything other than anger and hate ever again. I didn't think I had the capacity to love or feel love ever again in my life. I was dead on the inside. So when they hit me with that love sledgehammer, it hit me hard. Eventually you prayed a prayer. What was the prayer that you prayed? Got to the end of the course and I sat in my cell and I tried the sinner's prayer that you get on the pamphlets. Didn't work for me. And I just said, God, if you're real, I had a few swear words in it, but I'll, I'll edit them out. God, if you're real, prove it. Take away my drug addiction. Take away my violent nature. Take away all this anger and bitterness that are just ripping me apart inside. And if you do that for me, I will live the rest of my life for you. And when I said it, I meant it. The only thing you've got in prison really is your word. And I really did mean it. If I said to someone, I'm going to break your jaw, I would. So when I said to God, do this for me and I'll do that for you. I meant it with every fibre of my being. And what happened? Uh, nothing. I went <laughs> to bed. And... <laughs> but the following morning, I don't know what I was expecting. No booming voice, shaking cell door, non nothing. Um, but when I woke up the next morning, there was a series of really freaky events within the first hour of getting out of bed. First thing, I'd usually roll over and grab a cigarette and smoke it in bed. I was always gagging for a fag first thing in the morning. And... As soon as I touched the cigarette, I felt violently sick. I felt like I was going to projectile vomit across the cell. Couldn't stand the thought of it, touch, smell, nothing. I freaked out. I threw it out of my cell window. I had to get it out of my cell. Then the thought of the tobacco I had popped into my head and the sickness came back. I grabbed the tobacco and threw that out of the cell window too. And then usually after smoking the cigarette, I'd smoke a spliff. But as soon as that thought popped into my head, I became even more sick. And I grabbed my cannabis and I threw that out of the window too. So whoever was on yard cleaning duty that morning <laughs> must have thought it was Christmas come early. Uh, and then I think you went to shave. What happened then? Yeah, I was freaking out. I said, Daryl, calm yourself down, sunshine. Just go, get a wash, get a shave. I went to the sink, started getting a wash and shave, and I looked in the mirror, and I did not recognize the guy in the mirror. The, the smile and the beaming and the glowing and then I noticed I wasn't just looking happy I was feeling happy not just happy euphorically happy it was as if someone had unscrewed the top of my head and just poured freezing cold water in and everything had gone the anger had gone the addiction had gone I couldn't explain how but all that ball of anger that was eating me had been replaced with this huge ball of joy and I was just feeling a high million times higher than any combination of any drug I'd ever had How did your, your friends, your mates there, react to what had happened to you? Standing up within that prison setting and saying I was renouncing violence and I was giving my life to Jesus and I was going to walk away from the life I had, it was a big gamble for me because it opened me up to attack. Um, people would use that as an opportunity to get themselves up the pecking order. So slashing, stabbing, scolding, it was all a possibility. And a couple of days later, I was on the exercise yard and a lad got right in my face and he, he wouldn't have dared have attempted this a few days before but he saw the opportunity and he got right in my face my blood started to boil my hands started to shake I could visualize in my head I wanted to grab his ears and put his nose into the back of his head I could see what I wanted to do and then this voice came into my head and it just said you're not that man anymore and as soon as I heard it I knew what I had to do I had to turn around and I had to walk away and as soon as I turned, I started to walk. And every step I got further away from him, the calmer I became until I was completely and utterly at peace. And I heard the voice again, you're not that man anymore. It, it helped that one of the other lads jumped in and said, listen, he might have changed, but I haven't, so shut your mouth. <laughs> oh, the question I always ask people is, what difference has Jesus made? <laughs> I don't say this lightly, I really do mean it. He's more important to me than the air I'm breathing. Without him, I wouldn't be here. I've been shot at, I've been stabbed, I should be dead, I've overdosed, I don't know how many times, I should not be here. And yet here I stand. And if you stand still long enough, I'm gonna tell you about Jesus. And 
I would encourage each and every one of you with this new season of Alpha starting, if you haven't been on Alpha, if you're sitting there with doubts and questions, you're just not sure whether you should or you shouldn't, what have you got to lose? Choosing Jesus is a win-win situation. You cannot lose. There is nothing to lose. It's not like choosing a mortgage provider. You don't need to weigh up the best deal. This is the deal. Give it a go. I'd encourage you, give it a go. Thanks, Daryl. Very nice to meet you. During the time when I was molested from around at 10 years of age till about 13, it, it caused a lot of confusion in my life. Um, it caused a lot of fear in my life. I was afraid to have any kind of close relationship with anyone of the opposite sex. I was fearful to be around a female. I would not talk to them. I would not get close to them because I felt so ashamed inside because of what had happened to me that I felt that they looked at me with shame too. Even though they knew nothing about it, it just seemed like it was written all over my face and that they would know and that they would not want to be around me. I had no father to turn to. Um, we did not have contact for years. The first contact I really had with him was when I turned 18 and reached out to him. I had beliefs but did not attend church or anything. My family did not attend church. So God really wasn't centered in my life at all. I figured I was strong enough, tough enough to handle it myself, but obviously I wasn't. I did eventually start dating someone that I dated for a while, but that kind of furthered my insecurities because the relationship ended and it just really made it feel like it was my fault that the relationship ended. I didn't know why, truthfully, that it ended, but I don't know. When I first started viewing pornography, I would say I wasn't really introduced to it by anyone. It was finding some pornographic magazines and just lying out and just going through them and just finding arousal and excitement from that. It seemed like something safe for me to do um, because yes, there was that arousal, but I knew there was no way that those images could hurt me physically and I thought emotionally either. So to me, it seemed like a safe thing to do. No one was going to hurt me in return. Kept me sheltered, kept me locked inside for many years. Uh, it kept me so insecure that just going out with a group of people would frighten me. So it, it not only damaged in my thought perception of women, but just in people in general. You know, I just had a major fear of getting close to anyone. With viewing pornography, it seems like you always want more and you always have, have to up the ante. So the level I was at just became to a point where it didn't seem exciting enough. So I started into looking at things that were illegal in nature. And, and it was just maybe the thrill of doing something that was wrong too. I did not ever do anything I considered wrong in my life or anything that was horrible, never did anything against anyone, never um, carried a gun, never robbed a bank, never did anything like that, never what I felt was exciting, never really did anything exciting. So to me it was a chance for me to up the ante and do something a little more thrilling in a way. So it's, it progresses where you just seem like you need more and more and more, but something a little more challenging, a little more thrilling. With the illegal activities in my life, I would really say it's a lot of the roots came from my childhood and being molested by someone close that was in my family. And it happened at such an early age 
that I couldn't get past that age in my life. I would say that viewing the pornography, I did kind of act out the offense that happened to me when I was younger. Um, this was not only sexual abuse against myself, but also my sister too. So there was a lot of remembering of that also. So it was a lot of, it was something I knew was wrong that had happened to me, but it was the only sexual feelings that I've ever had in my life, really up to that point. And so I guess it was something that almost seemed normal to me. So I couldn't really escape that part of my life. When I was viewing the under, underage pornography, I really felt that I needed to cry out to somebody. And I finally cried out to somebody. It wasn't a Christian, but I still felt it was better than keeping it inside. Well, time after that, a couple months after that, this person decided to turn me in. And one day, my wife received a phone call from the sheriff's department and that they wanted to talk to her about some of my activities. And she was, she didn't have a clue what was going on. I kept it from her. Um, even at that point, I had stopped, but it was still something I kept secret from her. I wasn't going to tell her, just as I wasn't going to tell her anything that happened to me in my past, because that was all shameful activities for me. And she called me and said, okay, the sheriff department has just called me. What's going on? And it's just, and I knew what was going on at that point. And I just felt like the walls were crashing down on me. My first thought was just to run. I figured my wife's going to leave me. Um, we had just recently been married about six months ago before that. Um, and I just really felt like my life was over. So my only thought was just to run away from everything. Um, but I didn't. And I went in and talked to her and talked to my wife's parents and we all sat down together. Finally, I was able to talk to her about the abuse that happened earlier in my life. And instead of her running away from me, she opened her arms up to me. And totally opposite of what I ever expected to happen. And finally, I had someone that I could talk to about everything and now not hide anything from. And it's really the first time in my life that I've ever had anybody that I could talk openly to. So it was really a freeing feeling, but that, that did not change the consequences that I'd have to go through. When the police came to talk to me, I decided just to be totally honest and open about everything that had been happening. So I just confessed everything openly, did not want to lie about anything more in my life, did not want to hide anything, did not want to cover anything up. So I confessed it freely. And I would say about a year later, I was sentenced to prison and served 17 months. At the time I went to prison, I was a believer at this point. I would say this whole experience of being arrested and just going through that with my wife and family really drew me closer to God at that point. It still wasn't a really strong relationship, but it was closer than I'd ever been before. When I went to prison, I really had nobody at that point. And so I really started reaching out to God even stronger. And really that's when my relationship with Christ really became as strong as that it's ever been. After I became a Christian, I did struggle at times wondering why, why did I have to go through the childhood I went through? Um, I understood why I had to go through the things I was going through now, but why was I, why did I have to go through things I did when I was, you know, the things I went through when I was a child? And 
I know it wasn't God's choice for me for any of this to happen. But I also know that God uses events in people's lives to be able to reach out to others who are in need too. With what I'm doing right now and confessing all this openly, um, I know that God is working, um, not only in my life, but he can use this to help many other lives too. So just God's redemptive power is just awesome. The healing from the pornography, even though it's a challenge that's a struggle that I'll always have throughout my life, it seemed to be a little more manageable than dealing with the past abuse in my life. That was probably the biggest struggle to ever overcome because I always felt really that the abuse was my fault. Maybe I was asking for it in some way. Maybe, maybe I deserved it. And these were people that I knew were supposed to love me, but why would someone that's supposed to love me hurt me? And it took such a long time to understand that it really wasn't my fault. So the healing was more of a struggle there than anything. What finally led to me believing that this wasn't my fault was I did some counseling sessions. And I was able to look at myself as a child again, put myself back into those shoes, but this time having the knowledge that I have now and realize that I really wasn't asking for any of this to happen to me, that I really did, didn't deserve to have any of this happen to me. And finally, I was able to forgive myself. That was probably the hardest person to ever forgive was myself because I felt that all the abuse had to be my fault. So I couldn't forgive myself for any of it. But when I finally realized in my life, this wasn't my fault, it's not something I deserved, I was able to forgive myself and finally really be free of that and move on. The counseling that I went through that helped me uh, really reach this breakthrough in my life probably occurred over a couple year period. So it wasn't something that was just a uh, a one-day process, uh, even a couple-month process. So it took, it took some time to move through these issues, but uh, the counseling was a great healing experience for me. Dealing with issues of pornography, I know it's going to be a challenge throughout my life. But I know the hurt that I've caused my family the hurt that I've caused my children being away from them. And so I know that I never want to harm them again. But I use resources. I use uh, people to talk to, accountability partners. Some of the breakthrough moments that I've had with uh, freeing myself from the pornography addiction have been realizing that, you know, people in these images are actually people. They're not just objects. And these people that deserve a lot more, the people really don't deserve to be an object. People have feelings. I would not want my own children to ever be viewed in this way. And I know if that would have ever happened to them, Um, I, I know the hurt that it would have caused me and the hurt that it would cause them. And the last thing I want to have happen is for anyone close to me, especially my children, to be hurt. Through all the challenges in my life, my relationship with Christ obviously has grown stronger and stronger. And... It's really because God's grace has been so evident. Um, I've known that with most relationships and most marriages that the spouse 
would have left in this situation. And God brought someone into my life that I would be able to share with and who would not leave. And God brought a family into my life in my wife's family that was so loving and so helpful and so willing to put their arms around me through this tough time. And God's blessed me with two children now. Um, this is something that I never thought would ever be possible in my life, to have a wife, to have my own children. And even though I've felt like I've been, well, even though my life has been extremely challenged, um, he's given me so much. He's given me, again, a loving wife, a loving family, loving children, so his grace has just been so incredibly powerful. I know there's that I'm not the only person who has ever struggled with pornography, who has even struggled with underage pornography. And you might be feeling at this point in your life that you're trapped, that you have no one to talk to, as I felt. But you do have a way out. But first you gotta start with your relationship with Christ. You gotta ask for forgiveness. You gotta ask to be healed. And you may have to go through hell to get there, but you will come back and God will free you. I mean, I just want someone to know that, and maybe I should just say this, you know, they might feel, you might feel that, you, that everything in your life has come to an end. That if you bring this forward, that your life's gonna be over but your life won't be over. If you confess it to God and give it to God, He will take it away from you. He will free you from it. He will lift that burden from you. And he will give you peace. And He will bring you new life, just as He has brought me. I'm going to start my story. Uh, when I was 15 years old, I've been uh, put into a home for people with a uh, family problem. They were older guys than me and they were drinking alcohol, they were taking drugs, they had problem with the police. Many of them they went to jail and they put them there when they went out. So very quickly I started myself to do all those things. And then I started uh, wanting to try to do white magic, occultism, you know, something I started with like a game with friends. Uh, we tried to make mind reading or palm reading or card reading, those kind of things. And I discovered that I had a, a gift, you know, that I had revelations. And I was fascinated because I saw that not everybody had that gift. So I, tr I started to explore it. I wanted to see what kind, to what extent I had it. So I started to interest myself into the Oriental mysticism. I started to have kind of divination possibilities, powers, and to read into uh, people's mind to know when before they came what they were saying and I could see the aura A-U-R-R-A of people which is like their spirit so whatever the way they would be they would behave in front of me if I saw the, 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 the aura I could see exactly who they were I could see also you know spirits uh, you call them maybe ghosts then little by little I wanted to to see what power I could get so I went uh, rapidly into uh, black magic. Uh, black magic is uh, something not very good. It's when uh, you using some spiritual power to um, 
not for the benefit of people to make them problem maybe to curse them or to make them lose their job or that their wife or husband go away whatever and uh, you can uh, give them uh, maybe illness or kill them and I did some of uh, those things uh, one of them uh, she I watched her died in front of me uh, she bled to she bleed to death in front of me so I had you know I, I was happy to see that I had those power but I was not feeling very good you know I had very uh, difficult spiritual problems uh, I tried to uh, suicide myself and then they put me uh, you know in a psychiatrist hospital for a while uh, I, ha I had a uh, NDE a near death experience uh, which is uh, uh, you know when when you are going to die um, your yourself your spirit your soul is going out of your body and then you will uh, go to God of course your body will go to dust and so I lived those few those first minutes and I saw that I was not ready until that day I was not afraid of death I thought uh, um, on the contrary that uh, death would solve all my problems uh, I thought I have so many problems here of every kind you know inside I was getting paranoid and uh, so much anguish and I didn't I, I didn't have any motivation and uh, I was living to to die you know o all my friends were dying around me and uh, I thought I would die before the age of 20 and I thought that all my problem would be solved and um, stopped at the moment when I died but when I, I made this experience I saw that it's it's not stopping and not only it's not stopping but I will not have to bear those uh, problem and those torment for just uh, 40 years or 60 years but for eternity so fortunately I went back in my body I didn't die and after that I tried to change my life and to make a better life I, I knew I was bad so I started to practice yoga and sport I stopped all toxics even cigarettes, even meat, and I tried to be a better person. I wanted to purify myself, my soul, my spirit from all the consequences of the thing I did. I thought I could like uh, become a new person, like uh, uh, re reborn myself into a new person and that all the things that I did before will have no consequences on who I was now because I, I thought I wanted to be a new person a new creature after six months of intensive practice I had a revelation that if I can do anything to improve myself try to be pure to behave good with uh, other people uh, to be uh, ascetic to make to uh, practice yoga uh, anything I can do to be better or if I'm the worst guy on in the on the on, on on earth, I am not getting nearer God of one inch. So I realized that I couldn't do anything with my own strength to get near God. One day a friend of mine invited me in a Christian meeting. I hated Christians. So I say, of course no, of course no. But he was insisting, and I don't know why uh, I answered him, I said uh, to him, Okay, I come on in one condition. You never talk to me again about any meeting. I come once in my life for one hour, and after I'm gone, and you don't talk to me about any meeting. At one point when he was preaching, I saw his aura. And it was the brightest aura, the purest the whitest, the, the cleanest, the more powerful aura I ever seen in my life and I knew that this was the il ultimate power so I knew that this guy had the ultimate spiritual power and I wanted to get this power. He preached again 
And at what moment he said, the people who want to receive the power of God just come over in front. So I jumped in front, you know, I closed my eyes and I was waiting to receive the ultimate power. Unfortunately, in my mind, I saw Jesus and I saw the cross. So I was, say, I was thinking, I don't want Jesus. I don't want the cross. Just go away. I want the power. So God spoke in my spirit. He told me that I had to accept Jesus and the cross because if I continue the life I'm having now, in six months I'm dead. He showed me the length of time. He showed me how I would die. Because I had this near-death experience, I knew that I was not prepared, I was not ready to die, and I didn't want to be tormented forever. So, almost against my will, I capitulated. I accepted Jesus and the cross. I just did this to save my neck. Now, 30 years later, I am grateful to God because he had to act like this because I wouldn't have a second chance. Maybe you who are listening, maybe you still have 10 years ahead of you, maybe 20, maybe 30. Maybe you already, already had a chance with God and maybe God will give you a second chance, maybe a third chance. But in my case, this was, this was my first and last chance. And God, I am grateful that God saved me in spite of me, he found a way to save me because he knew that I was in six months I would be buried, my body would go back to the dust, and my spirit would go back to him. And I was not ready to die. So I am very grateful to him now to be saved. I am not afraid to die because I know where I am going.